Hello everyone. Welcome to Neo IAS Daily Prelim Current Affair Class. Today we are covering 25th June Current Affair. Important topics which we are discussing today are Enrollment Ratio, Mongolia, World Heritage Convention. First topic, Enrollment Ratio. Recently, a CAG report with regarding to Andhra Pradesh state highlighted that the gross enrollment ratio, that's GER, is low compared to national average in the case of primary schools. And coming to enrollment ratio, we actually use different type of enrollment ratio globally. We have a UNDP sustainable development goals which target a goal of increasing education, which is goal number four. And in this goal, we have various targets which actually gives to enroll more people or more students into schools. And this enrollment is actually tracked under various ratio like GER, NER, ASER, NERA. And out of this most important one is GER, that's gross enrollment ratio. Gross enrollment ratio is number of students enrolled in a specific grade level regardless of age divided by the total number of students at that age level. Suppose a village has number of students age uh, 7 as 1000 and the number of students enrolled in corresponding level that is class 2 or grade 2 as 100. Gross enrollment ratio will be equal to 100 divided by 1000 that is 10 percentage. However, this gross enrollment ratio has got its own drawback. We actually use this as a global standard or the standard in almost all nations. However, I already to told you that it goes, got its own limitations. First limitation is that it actually speaks of a student's enrolled in a particular grade. Here in the case of particular grade, there can be problems of students failing and retaining in the same level. Suppose a student named A actually was studying in the level or grade 2 was not able to make in the grade 3. So the, the same student will have to remain in the grade 2. So in that case the gross enrollment ratio will increase. However, in the real scenario or the real amount is not increasing. And also there can be possible cases of when, they, fam, when the parents enroll students into the education system at a higher at a lower stage or lower age or higher age. Suppose the parents of student A actually enrolled him into education level or education at a uh, lower age like uh, age of 4. So he will be uh, in the grade 2 at the age of 6. So that is a, a difficult problem because uh, there can be issues of people return, students returning, returning at this level. There can be issues of overage and underage students. Uh, I already told you that there can be students which, which are enrolled in at a lower age which is currently studying second grade and there can be some cases when parents enroll the same or the student at a lower higher age like uh, the student A was enrolled by his parents at the age of 7. So he will be studying at grade 1 in the age 7. So uh, he will be attaining uh, this grade, he will be reaching grade 2 by age of 8. So gross enrollment ratio cannot be used as an accurate method for finding how much students are actually studying in that school or how much how many students are enrolled in the schools. And to clarify this, we actually brought down net enrollment rate. In the case of net enrollment rate, we actually find it in the basis of age level. So there is a like for every country, the education there is a there will be theoretical age group for class one there will be age level will be 6 and for class 2 age level will be 7 and so on. So they will be checking how many students are actually enrolled for a given level of education at the corresponding age level. Suppose in a village out of 1000 students age 6 only 100 are enrolled in grade 1 and 2 students which were enrolled last year in grade 1 are, did not make into grade 2. So number of students will be current, which will be currently studying in grade 1 will be 52. In that case, gross enrollment ratio will be 52 divided by 1000. 
but ner will be 50 divided by 1000 because ner also take into account the age level of student here there is no regard for age here we actually take into account age level also ner address the issue of student retention at the same level however when the case of student enrolling at uh, under age or higher age that issue cannot be tackled with net enrollment rate because net enrollment rate actually looks at specific level and specific age student studying in that level if suppose in a suppose the parent of student a actually enrolled him at age 7 in grade level or age 5 in grade level 1 so he'll be studying in but he will not be enrolled in net enrollment rate and how in that case actually when he attends the age level 6 he will be studying in grade 2 so that number will not be accounted in net enrollment rate that's one drawback of ner so to re rectify this error we actually brought down age specific enrollment ratio in the case of age specific enrollment ratio we actually uh, brought down uh, a single specific age and there is no level so we actually take into age level those people students which are age 6 and how many of them are enrolled in school there is no specific level so if a age num student age 6 is enrolled in level 1 or level 2 or level 3 they all three are taken into account so in this case there is no level of education whereas in this case we actually take into age plus level of education and here we actually not, did not take into account age I hope it's clear in the case of age specific enrollment rate it doesn't take into account the level of education hence we actually or the researchers cannot know which level each student are accommodated into that's one drawback of ASER in the case of NARA or adjusted net enrollment rate it is different as total number of students out of that locality or out of that village enrolled in a particular school and here we do not take into account which level they are accommodated into only thing which actually take into account is the primary age group suppose the primary age group is between 6 and 14 out of the 6 and 14 age students in the village how many are enrolled into school and that's uh, that's we actually did in NERA in the case of gross enrollment ratio we actually take in the level of education but there is no consideration for age in the case of net enrollment rate both age and level of education are taken into account in the case of ASCR we actually take into age consideration age but there is no consideration for level of education or which grade they are studying in the case of adjusted net enrollment rate there is a age group but it's a broader one and how many of them are accommodated into the school are taken into account I hope it is clear uh, please go through the material I have given in detail about everything about the limitations and how what are the implications of these four enrollment ratio this four enrollment ratio are, are given in United Nations sustainable development goal which is also known as 2013 agenda and there is goal number four which deals with education for calculating how much education level each country has achieved we actually use or the UN, UNDP actually use various type of methods and out of this various type of methods there are four enrollment rate and these are GER, NER, ASER and NERA. I hope it is clear. Next topic, World Heritage Convention. World Heritage Convention was in news recently because the World Heritage Committee will be meeting and deciding on in inclusion of various sites and exclusion of some other and about World Heritage Convention. It's a, as the name indicates, it's a convention meant to protect heritage sites. These heritage sites can be of cultural type, can be natural sites, can be of mixer type. Mixer means both having both the property of cultural and natural sites. And the convention was adopted in the year 1972. And uh, it is actually, there are 193 parties right now to the convention. And uh, what convention do actually it establish a world heritage list. This world heritage list right now con contains around 1073 sites. And a country or a 
uh, a region or country can nominate a particular site into this World Heritage List. For this, actually, there are certain designated agencies within the country. In the case of India, there is Archaeological Survey of India, which is ASI. And this Archaeological Survey of India actually nominates a particular site into consideration of World Heritage Con Committee. And these sites are evaluated against 10 criteria which are brought down by, by this convention by International Center for International Council on Monument and Sites and World Conservation Union. And they actually reviews this site and uh, they present a report to World Heritage Committee which, which grants or which recognize the site as World Heritage Site. Last year, we had a site which was declared as a World Heritage Site, the walled city of Ahmedabad. Currently, we have 36 natural, so 36 World Heritage Sites in India. And apart from maintaining World Heritage List, the said committee, that's World Heritage Committee, actually pro maintains a World Heritage Fund. And these funds are given to several countries which are hosting this heritage site for the conservation and monitoring of these sites. And why country are means nominating these sites to World Heritage Convention or World Heritage Committee? Because this uh, recognition actually brought the site into world attention. Thus, they attract more tourists and uh, also they get more fund from World Heritage Fund. And there are other sections like World Heritage Site in Danger. And uh, these are actually produced in order to make uh, or generate awareness, awareness among the member party so as to ne take necessary measures to protect the site. The World Heritage Committee is located at World uh, Con Conservation Center in Paris. And uh, this center is located right now in UNESCO Center in Paris. And uh, there are three non-governmental organizations which actually work as an advisory to the convention. Three advisory bodies are IUCN World uh, Conservation Union. It's for natural property. For the case of cultural property, the advisory body is International Council on Monument and Site. For the restoration of cultural property, it is the body is International Center for Study of Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property. And in the case of India, Canada India has, I will tell you, it has 36 World Heritage Site, and out of which 28 are cultural. 7 are natural and 1 is mixed. The mixed one is currently located in uh, Sikkim. And recent addition to the cultural site was the walled city of Ahmedabad in the year 2070. And the nodal organization for recommending uh, world heritage sites in India is Archaeological Survey of India. And that's it about World Heritage Convention. Next topic, Mongolia. Honorable Home Minister of India is right now in Mongolia and he recently inaugurated the first petrochemical refinery project in Mongolia. And there was a news regarding the third neighbor policy of Mongolia. And where is Mongolia located? Mongolia is actually is a country of East Asia. It is a country which is sandwiched between Russia and China. So it has only two neighbor, that's one is Russia and third one, second one is China. And the capital of the country is Ulaanbaatar. And uh, basically, this country's geography is actually a plateau type. Country can be divided into three basic topographic zones. The west side and south side is dominated by, dominated by mountain chains. And in between, there is a basin. And the other side is located by, occupied by plateaus. And the, there is, a country is famous for its grassland steppe. And there are good number of horsemen actually guarding this pasture land. And... Uh, the Mongolia is, due to its actually uh, harsh geography, the number of population or amount of population is very less. It's the least densely populated, one of the least densely populated country in the world. And uh, it's second largest landlocked country after Kazakhstan. The Gobi Desert, the largest desert in Asia, a part of that is located in the southern part of Mongolia. Coming to the political structure, the country is actually a semi-presidential representative democratic republic country. What do you mean semi-presidential? Uh, Actually, it contains both the feature of parliamentary and presidential structure. Uh, the, here the president is a directly elected by people and he is not like a ceremonial head like in the case of parliamentary republic. However, it, he doesn't have that much power which he is actually enjoying in presidential system. 
So there is a mix of both parliamentary and presidential system. And the here executive is directly responsible to legislature. And uh, the country is dotted with three major mountain range. Out of these three major, the fam most famous one is Altai Mountains, which actually occupies its south and southwest side. There is a Kandli Mountain is also there. And there is a Kangli Mountain, which actually occupies the north border with Russia. And the, uh, there are several lakes in this Mongolia. And the largest lake is Uvs. And three major rivers occupy this Mongolia. One is Orkon, Kerlan and Selenji. Countries basically lacks very less lacks natural resources. Right now, the country is focusing on its uh, foreign policy to develop this country. And the country initiated a two type of foreign policy, a new type of policy, which is called third neighbor policy. Third neighbor policy uh, is actually like, uh, the Mongolia has two neighbor, one is China and the one is Russia. Without antagonizing this uh, two neighbor, the country is actually looking to expand its foreign policy to other sector. That's a third neighbor policy. And recently, India appreciated this third neighbor policy. That's it about Mongolia. That's it about today's current affair. Have a nice day. Thank you.